This is the last session on Friday, so we're a little quiet, but maybe more people will come in. Hey, we're going to talk about real-world DevOps with the Microsoft ALM ranges. And the story I want to tell starts about three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago, I got a new customer, and I was a consultant. I went to them because they were having some problems while building their web application. And when I came there, I noticed a couple of things. First of all, they didn't use any source control. They used a network share, and they copied their files to the network share to merge. So their process was as long as you work in one file, and all the other developers have each and has their own file, you don't have a problem. They didn't have a build server, of course. They deployed by just copying stuff to a customer and whatever. So there was a moment that I thought, yeah, I mean, I know we can do this better. But how can I help a customer? How can you help the community to raise the awareness, to, do, to make sure that people discover those things? And while researching it, while thinking about it, I came across the Microsoft ALM ranges. And three years ago, January 2014, I became an ALM ranger. My nomination was accepted, and from that moment on, a lot happened. I started doing more speaking. I gave more presentations for the ranges, and I just generally on Agile, DevOps, application lifecycle management. I started uh, to write a couple of books. I wrote one book last year on DevOps on a Microsoft stack, and finally, it led to me becoming a Microsoft ALM MVP and really specializing in this area. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. First, who are the ALM ranges? Just general introduction to make sure that we know what we're talking about. And then, how do we do DevOps? And what is DevOps? Right? Just make, making sure we have a common definition, and then we go in deep, and we're going to look into how do we do DevOps, and hopefully, right, the examples I will show, uh, maybe you can learn something from it, or you can pick, uh, copy something to your own projects or your own situation and apply it there. So let's start with who are the ALM ranges? This is the most important link from a talk. It goes directly to our blog. If you follow it, you will find all kinds of information, who we are, what we do, why we do it, all kind of the things we've published, the solutions we have, everything. Sometimes I hear people think that we are the power rangers. Uh, I've heard it a couple of times while giving this talk, and some people, some people tweeted this picture, so I, thought, oh, I included it in my session. We're not the Power Rangers. I mean, the ALM Rangers are just a group of people who are passionate, right, who love software development, who love things like application lifecycle management, agile, DevOps. And we do that by following a common mission. This is our mission. Our mission is all around filling gaps. Of course, you've got Microsoft, you've got a product group, they built a lot of software, they built tooling like Team Foundation Server and Visual Studio Team Services that you can use for right, doing DevOps and agile. But sometimes there is a gap, and the gap could be a missing guidance, or maybe some missing tooling, or some other stuff that's just not completely right, or that's really specific to the situation of a couple of customers, and that's where we come in. The ALM ranges are the ones who try to fill those gaps, and who try to help and make sure right, that the adoption of software like Visual Studio Team Services and Team Foundation Server, everyone can adopt it, everyone can work with it, and it works in the best possible way. That's what we're trying to do. We're in the ALM ranges are here since 2006. So last year, we had our 10th year anniversary. For me, that was almost the third year. And if you look at what we've done, we've done quite a lot. And maybe you know some of the things huh, here on the, on the slide. First of all, we did stuff for awareness. Awareness is making sure that people know that we exist as ALM ranges, that they can ask us to help them, but also making sure that um, Visual Studio Team Services, all the features, everything you can do with it, all the other stuff that Microsoft has, like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and other products, and that people know what they, what they can do with it, that they can use it, and that they use it in the right way. Guidance, and, well, the most popular one is the branching guidance. Who of you has maybe never heard about the ALM ranges but used the version control guidance from the ALM ranges? Has anyone used it? It's really popular, it's been downloaded, hundreds of thousands of times, and it explains, hey, how do you set up your branching? What do you do? Uh, simple branching schemes, but also more complicated with hot fixes and service packs and stuff like that. That content is now all migrated, and it go it's gone into fizzlestudio.com, into the official, uh, official documentation. But that one is quite popular. Another one which was very popular are the talks we have on Channel 9. Uh, Channel 9 is Microsoft's TV channel where they distribute all kinds of videos and films for free. 
have for conferences, but also have interviews with ALM ranges, ALM MVPs, where they talk about different stuff. And finally, we've done a lot of tooling. And tooling can be things like um, some extension for Visual Studio team services. Uh, that's really popular. But also a tool like an ARM template to install a Sony Cube server. Uh, so you can automate the installation of such a server on Microsoft Azure. How do you do that? How do you do that in a secure way? We've also created stuff like that. So we try uh, to balance between these three categories and make sure that what we do uh, helps the community. So that's a general introduction to the ALM ranges. Now uh, let's move on to what is DevOps and how do we do DevOps. And what can we learn from it? First, what is DevOps? Well, maybe you've seen this picture before. Had a blind man trying to identify an elephant, and depending on what they have and where they are, they see a different part of the elephant. And some think, hey, this is a tail, or maybe it's a, it's a broom or something, or uh, maybe it's a water hose, or whatever. It depends on uh, it's a small uh, part of the big elephant, and it depends on their perspective. And I see the same happening with DevOps. With DevOps, you also have a lot of different interpretations. As some people say, DevOps is all about automation, or DevOps is only about culture, and it's about putting Dev and Ops, development and operations, together and making sure that they start working together and then everything will change. Or some people say, no, it's about feature toggles and about monitor. Well, maybe hey, you recognize some of these. And, you know, all of them are true. They're all a part of DevOps. But what we like to use is a definition by Donovan Brown, he is the principal DevOps program manager at Microsoft, so it is, his, it is his job to make sure that everything that Microsoft produces, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Team Service, other tools, has good support for DevOps, and that Microsoft has a good DevOps story, that they can help you to move your company, your projects to DevOps. And what he says is, well, DevOps is about three things. People, process, and products, products or tools. And what you want to do is you want to use those three as optimal as possible, and then make sure that you use them to optimize your process with the end goal of delivering value to the customer. And so automation, yeah, that's important. But automation is way more important if your goal is, okay, I want to deliver it to the customer as soon as possible, as fast as possible. So this is the definition that we use as the ALM ranges, and we want to have a continuous flow of value to our customers, and we try to improve our process, the products we use, the people we work with to make sure that that's what we can do. So how do we do DevOps? Well, I want to go to the three areas, people, process, and products, and discuss short how do we do DevOps for such an area. Product will be the biggest one. I will also have a couple of demos where I will show some stuff of the ALM ranges and how things work, just to make sure that you get a real sense of what we do and you hopefully can use it in your own products, projects. So let's start with people. Microsoft ALM ranges, there are about 100 ALM ranges worldwide. Half of them is an employee of Microsoft, half of them is not. I'm not, I don't work for Microsoft, I work for Ordina in the Netherlands. And so the distribution of 50-50. We have one full-time ranger, which is our program manager, you see him here on the picture, Willy Peter Schaub. He works for Microsoft and he's the only one that works full-time at Ranger Project. So he helps us, he makes sure that we have a direct link to the product group, that we know what they are planning, what we want to do, and that we build the right things and help in the right way. All of us are part-timers. Uh, we do this next to our regular job, uh, and we try to do it yeah, as much as possible. But of course, that depends. Eh? We all have a job, family, and other things. So we try to balance our time and make sure that uh, we can help the community as best as possible. One of the things we have to cope with is that we're a distributed team. Here in the UK, there are ranges. In the US, there are a lot of ranges, but also a lot of other places. I'm from the Netherlands. We have ranges on every continent and in a lot of countries. So that's also one of the challenges when it comes to being an ALM ranger. When you want to schedule a meeting, you have to make sure that everyone is awake at the same moment. So you have to pick a time zone, you have to pick a time and make sure, okay, this is where we're going to do our meeting. So this also has influenced our process. The way we do DevOps has been influenced by the fact that we're a distributed team all over the world with people everywhere. So what does our process look like? Well, one thing which is interesting is how do we start? I mean, there is some idea, someone thinks of something, or we find a gap, or maybe a customer 
uh, points us to a gap or the product group asks us to do something. Okay, that's what we start with. We start with an ID. Then we make sure that we're going to pitch the ID not only to Microsoft, but also to the ALM range themselves, because we're all part-timers. We do it voluntarily. We are the ones who decide what we want to work on. So we pitch an ID, and when the pitch is succeeded, we make sure that we have a concrete mission and a goal for the project. And finally, we form the team. And joining a team is yeah, something you decide for yourself. So most of the time, we have a backlog of items uh, that we can work on, a couple of projects that are uh, starting up or that already have some team members. And you can choose to join a team. Uh, and once you're part of a team, you start working towards the end goal. So that's the basic idea. And what I've seen is this, this doesn't only work for the ALM ranges. I've also seen companies apply this in-house. Uh, maybe some bigger companies who want to have innovation and stuff like that. Uh, they run informal projects where people can volunteer, and you need to pitch the ID, you need to have a vision. So this is not only applicable to the ALM ranges, but you can also use it in other situations. So, so maybe if you've got a big company and you want to think about innovation, please look at this model. And finally, we have a blueprint for, okay, what do we do once a project starts? First of all, we want to make sure that the teams aren't too big. Uh, we try to have teams six plus minus three, uh, which is also what the Scrum Guide says, uh, keep your team small, make sure that they can communicate well. So, for example, we try, but it's not always possible, to make sure that teams uh, live in the same time zone uh, so, so they can easily schedule a meeting and, and make sure they can work together. And we have a common sprint cadence. Uh, we follow a Scrum process, although I will explain a little bit later. Um, we have the same sprint cadence as Microsoft. Maybe you know that Microsoft works in sprints of three weeks. So we have, uh, we've made sure that we follow the same sprints. So we're in the same sprint number as they are. We start our sprint when they start. We end our sprint when they end. And this helps communication. So maybe when you're in a larger company or even a small company where you work on multiple products, uh, aligning your sprints really helps with communication. Uh, you'll see that if someone says, oh, it will be done in sprint, 120, then you know what they mean. Hey, you don't first have to ask, oh, in which sprint are you now? How long are your sprints? What are you going to do? Uh, having a common cadence makes things easier. I already mentioned the common vision. Uh, each team needs to have a vision, and they need to be enthusiastic about it. Uh, they need to, to build something they actually like, they want to build, they want to work on, uh, and it needs to be clear what they're doing. When we pitch an ID, we mostly build a small prototype, especially if you think about the Visual Studio Team Services extensions, which I will show in a moment. Uh, those are actual products. Uh, they have some goal and some ID behind them. And we try to pitch them first with a small prototype. Uh, we present it to other ranges. We present it to the Microsoft product group. And when everyone likes it, uh, we know what to do, and we can continue uh, expanding the prototype. We've also noticed that because we're all part-timers, part yeah, we need to keep it in account when we do our scheduling. I mean, having a multi-release plan for some functionality, for guidance, or maybe an extension, or some other tooling, that's just not going to work. I mean, we can't look in the future. We don't know uh, how much time we, we will have. So we try to keep our project small, and that really helps. We try to have, have one epic. If you think about portfolio management, at the highest level, you've got epics. We need that we've got a couple of features, uh, one to three, and we need that it's what the team decides. So some teams uh, follow a scrum process and they say, okay, we try to have product backlog items and we split them in tasks. Others make sure that um, they do Kanban, for example, and they uh, don't split into tasks, but they just map their process on the Kanban board. That's up to the team. Uh, so we let them choose it for themselves the way they want to work, but making sure that uh, the release stays small, well, it's, yeah kind of essential to make sure we really produce something. Because we're distributed and we live in a lot of different places, we do our, uh, all our meetings through Skype. Uh, we use Skype for business, and we always make sure that we've got a recording of a, of a meeting. We store that in VSTS, so everyone can stay up to date, and you can always uh, look back at the recording to make sure that you know uh, what was decided in the last weekly stand-up. We don't have daily stand-ups. Uh, we try to do for each project, one meeting a week, yeah, and we store the recordings. What we also do, and this turns out to work really well, 
It's something we adopted from Microsoft, but Microsoft does internally because a lot of teams sometimes work eh, at large products, and you don't know what each team is doing, and, and maybe you, you lose sight of uh, the common goal, common vision. They share a really small video, mostly maximum three minutes, at the end of each sprint. Uh, it goes into a sprint summary email that gets sent to everyone, and everyone can easily see, oh, what are other teams doing? They give a small status update and a video, and when you watch the video, you know, okay, what have you done in the last sprint? What are they planning to work on? And are there any issues they ran into? And sharing this makes sure that although, although we're a distributed team uh, and we don't work together one-on-one, -on -one, we know what people are doing uh, and we still keep a common goal, a common vision. Finally, we try to implement Kanban for most of our projects. Uh, we, uh, we saw that using Scrum, uh, where we had a strict sprint cadence where we said, okay, sprint of three weeks, we do a planning at the start, review at the end. It became difficult because since we're part-timers, we don't have a fixed velocity. You can't say, okay, in my last couple of sprints, I did this much work, so I predict that in the next sprint, I will do this. So I'll, uh, in my planning meeting, I commit to a certain amount of work and we'll see how far we come. Yeah, that's just not feasible. I mean, we noticed that it just doesn't work, so we switched to Kanban where we said, okay, instead of following a strict process where we push work into the sprint. And we like to use the Kanban process where we pull work, uh, where someone says, okay, I've got time, uh, I'm working on a project, what can I do? He picks up an item and he decides for himself that he's going to work on it, and it goes through our process, and finally, it gets completed. That works really well, and uh, personally, when I do consultancy for, for companies that want to move to DevOps, I always suggest them to look at Kanban. Kanban really helps in mapping out your process, in seeing where your bottlenecks are, and making sure that you optimize the right thing. So if it's something you're running into, that you're doing Scrum, and you don't know, hey, what's the next step to innovate? Well, maybe you can have a look at Kanban. For us, it worked really good, and also see it working with customers. OK, what's a short introduction to who we are, what we do now, how we do it. I mean, we are the Microsoft ALM ranges. We're all software developers. so. We love our tools and our products. And when you think about Microsoft and DevOps, I hope you think about Team Foundation Server and Visual Studio Team Services. VSTS is a cloud-hosted environment for Microsoft that you can use to do DevOps. Team Foundation Server is the same product, but then on-premises. So every three months, Microsoft says, OK, we release an update for on-premises. And then VSTS and TFS have the same features. And VSTS has a couple of sprints. and then TFS aligns again. So we use it a lot. We use a lot of Visual Studio Team services and other Microsoft products, and we try to and make sure that those products work well together. So what did we do? Well, we started using Team services the moment it was released in the first preview. Is anyone here using Visual Studio Team services? Yeah? Team Foundation Server? OK, the others, yeah. Um, yeah, it works great. I mean, the big advantage for us is we don't have to keep it up to date anymore. Uh, we don't have to spend time on running updates, making sure that we patch our servers, that everything stays uh, in good shape and stays working. We can just focus on what, what we want to do. Visual Studio Team Service is managed by Microsoft, and it just works. This is the only, uh, not, not the only, but this is one of the biggest non-Microsoft products we use, Slack. Uh, we're probably going to move to Microsoft Team. uh, Teams wants it, uh, supports multiple Active Directory joining together and stuff like that. But we now use Slack. We really like it. Before, we used email, and we send a lot of email. So we did things where we had different distribution lists, say, so you could set up rules in Outlook that say, oh, if an email comes in, goes to this folder or go to that folder. Terrible. Slack works really good for us. We've got a channel for each project. So if you're interested in a project, you can just join the channel. We're, we've also got a couple of channels for general things. And maybe we just want to share something, we want to ask a question, we want to help each other. And so we use Slack for that. When it comes to Visual Studio Team Services, we've chosen to use the one team project to rule them all. I don't know if everyone's familiar with that. Uh, if you look at Visual Studio Team Services and TFS, at the highest level, you've got a project collection. A project collection maps behind the scenes directly to, to, to a database, so it's really isolated. So within a project collection, you can create team projects. Within team projects, you can create teams. And 
something that yeah, wasn't really clear, it's still not really clear in the project, of in the product is yeah, how do you create those teams and how do you map them to your structure in, in TFS? And what I see teams doing sometimes, or organizations, is, well, they have multiple team project collections, and within them they have a team project for each team, and within each team project they have one team, or maybe a couple of teams. Well, what we've tried to do is say, okay, but we want all those teams to work together. We want to make sure that we can do portfolio management, that we know uh, what's the status of all the teams, that we can run queries across multiple teams, uh, so you can see, okay, I've got an epic, uh, really high level, which teams are working on it, what are they doing, and because of that we've chosen for the one team project structure. So we have one team project collection on VSTS, one team project called ALM, and within that we have multiple teams. And those teams all have their own backlog, they have their own Kanban board, they have their own uh, location in source control, so they can run independently of the other teams, but at a higher level, you can aggregate all the data, and you know, okay, this is what my individual teams are doing, and this is what we're doing as, as an organization. And so maybe if you're interested in that, if you notice that you're using TFS, and you've got lots of team projects with lots of maintenance and configuration stuff, and, well, uh, take your favorite search engine, Look for one team project to rule them all. You will find a couple of blog posts that explain the ID and that can maybe help you in configuring your VSTS TFS environment. So I already said for work, we try to favor Kanban. So I'll give a demo of our Kanban board and how we use it. For code, uh, for our version control, we made a choice to say, okay, we want one really big TFVC repository, Team Foundation Version Control. And we use it mostly to store binary stuff, like video recordings, uh, big files. And each team has its individual Git repository. Uh, so if you look at our, our hierarchy, one TFEC project, a lot of Git repos, and they all map to a team except the top one, and uh, that maps to the organization. Another thing which is uh, maybe interesting for the people who are running VSTS or uh, who are maybe migrating from, TM, from TFS, is the idea of a scaling unit. If you look at the, um, the architecture that Microsoft uses to run VSTS, they've made a couple of decisions. They said, okay, we want to be 24-7. Uh, we want to keep the product running, make sure that everyone can use it all the time, even when we do updates. Of course, sometimes something goes wrong. I mean, uh, humans make mistakes that, that can happen. But what they've done is, okay, they've divided their product into scaling units. So you've got a couple of scaling units in the United States, you have some in Europe, some in Australia, other parts of the world. And what they do once they start rolling out an update, they start with scaling unit zero. If the update succeeds, they move to one. If the update succeeds, they move to two. Finally, they move to Europe, they move to Australia. And if something fails, they only have to roll back the scaling units they already deployed to. And our program manager always loves to say, that we are bleeding edge canaries. Maybe you've heard about the mining canary. Uh, when miners went into the mine, they always took a canary with them. If there were toxic gases, the canary would die. But then they would know they had to get out. Uh, so an early warning canary. Well, ALM ranges, we're the same. Hopefully we don't die, but um, we run on scaling unit zero. So whenever something gets updated, we always see it really soon, we know uh, that we can test it, we can work with it, and if it, it maybe sometimes we find issues, uh, we communicate with the product group, they fix them, and they fix them before they go externally to other product, uh, to, to other scaling units. And I will show you how you can discover your own scaling unit in the demo, if you're interested. I think at the moment, if you want to make sure that you get features as quickly as possible, you need to open an account in Brazil. Brazil is at the moment scaling unit one, so after zero, which is internal to Microsoft, one is the first that gets updated, and then it goes through the rest of the world. So if you look at the release notes for VSTS, you always have a sentence at the start that says something like, um, in the coming weeks, coming one or two weeks, you will get the following updates. That's because of scaling units. Right? They roll out gradually across the globe. What we've also done is we've got a couple of sandbox accounts. So we have our ALM Ranger, .fizzlestudio.com account. We also have a sandbox one, sandbox two, that we use for testing. And especially when it comes to extensions, uh, which are 
the products that you install into VSTS or TFS. We use those sandboxes to make sure that we can do beta testing before uh, it goes into the, uh, the general ALM Ranger account and before it goes to the marketplace. So I'll show a demo of that and how we use VSTS to do that. So demo time. Our DevOps home. This, can everyone see it? Uh, it's the new Visual Studio Team Service welcome page. Maybe you've already seen it. And if you look at our project, uh, this is our main project. We've also got another team project for link recording. So the one team project to rule them all isn't completely true. Uh, we've split this out just to make sure uh, that we yeah, can keep track of all the recordings we have and everything we do. But as you can see beneath the ALM project, uh, we've got, for example, team project health, create sample data widget team, generator team. And those are different teams that uh, do their own work, have their own backlog, work on their own stuff, uh, and they can do whatever they want. So if you move into the ALM Renshi team, one thing we really try to use, and here you see an example of that, is Markdown. I mean, as ALM Rangers, we write code, we create tooling. We also create a lot of guidance. And previously, we just used uh, Microsoft Word. Uh, whenever we shared something, uh, you turned on track changes, maybe you know it, and you can do the reviews and the comments and whatever. But merging those was always manually. So if a document went out to 100 ranges and a couple of them reviewed the document, and our program manager was the one who was uh, merging all those documents by hand. Well, that's not the best solution. So we switched to Markdown. Maybe you know Markdown. Markdown is just plain text. So if we edit this one, Yes, it's loading. Then you'll see that Markdown is just oh, a regular text. You've got some conventions, for example, if you say, um, if you start your line with this, uh, you get a header and things like that. Why do you, yes. The biggest advantage of this is um, we can now use our Git repositories to store markdown files in them, and we can use the pull request that Visual Studio Team Service and TFS have to merge the documentation. So we switched all our documentation to markdown. One thing we probably will add in the future, if we still want to add, is automatic conversions to PDF, Word, and stuff like that. Uh, you've got tooling for it. We now do it manually, but that, that, could, that could become a release pipeline where you say, hey, I take a document, and make sure it gets pushed to visualstudio.com or other locations where it can be downloaded. And if you look at our dashboard, oh, one of the which has failed loading, it's because of the internet speed here at NDC. And you see we try to track a lot of data. This is a dashboard that our program manager uses. So um, what we already said, we try to use epics at the highest level. And we need the epics. We've got features, we need them. We I've uh, got individual teams that do their work. We try to track, for example, the status of our builds. Uh, this is a custom widget that we're currently building as ALM ranges. It's not yet available on the marketplace, but we're working on it. And here you can see we've got 27 build definitions running for all our extensions, and they're all green, so everything is okay. Um, our program manager has this on a really large screen uh, in, in his office, and he always watches it, and when something goes wrong, he contacts us or sends out an email or something, but he's really happy that we have this and that he can follow it. Some custom widgets. This one, Team Project Help, but also these three. These are the countdown widgets. I'll show the code for them in a moment and explain how we've built them and uh, what you can learn from it, hopefully. And um, here you see a regular countdown widget where you can just say, hey, I want, you, uh, I want you to count down to a certain date. So for example, in 17 days, Tech Ready 24 will start, which is an internal Microsoft event. And we have two days, and then the sprint ends. So we try to use our own stuff. We try to make sure that we use a VSTS to the max and that we use everything that it has. This is our Kanban board at the highest level, the ALM level. As you can see, work in progress limit. It's not really our thing. Uh, it's something we, need, we definitely need to work on. But this is really easy to see. I mean, you know what we're working on, what's approved by uh, program management or Visual Studio Team Service product group or whoever has to make the decision. So whenever you've got time and you want to work on something, you can check out these items and make sure that you do something that's useful. This 
is a little, a little smaller. This is the one for the team project health, the one that showed the build status. This is one I'm, I'm currently working on with my team, and what you see here is, well, apparently one item is currently committed, and Jacob is working on it. Another one is approved, and I'm going to work on it, so when I start, I'll move it to committed. And we're now looking into actually modifying the OutScan man boards and making sure that the process we follow, uh, we've got uh, people who, for example, especially look at UX, uh, user experience and design, uh, that they get their own process step and we don't forget them before we do a release and uh, the same for testing. So this is something we're going to expand upon, but for us it works really good. And as you can see, uh, in this case, we didn't make the decision to add tasks, but if you want, you could just say, hey, I want to split this. Uh, I want a task that um, covers a certain part and another part, uh, and you can just add them and they will be stored. The same for test cases, uh, the same for branches that you can start from here. So this is something that works really good. And yeah, if you're not familiar with CAM, then I would really advise you to look into it and uh, see if it can do something for you. This is our ALM TFEC repository. So this is Team Foundation Version Control, as we all know it since the first versions of TFS. We've got a lot of markdown files uh, just in our repo that we use as documentation, but we've also got Git repositories for the individual projects. And for example, if you move to the team project health, uh, you'll see that that Git repository yeah, is really small. Uh, we just have to code in that as required by the team. The team has ownership over the repository, and uh, they know how they can use it. And they also use branches and pull requests. We try to use Git flow. Uh, so if you're getting started with Git and with Git repositories and you don't know, hey, how should I do the branching? How does everything work? And uh, how should I merge back? And what, are, what actually is a pull request and stuff like that? Look into Git flow. Git flow, I mean, it's not uh, the best solution on earth, but it, it gives you a good structure to get started with using Git and making sure that you use it in the right way. And personally, I always advise companies to move to Git. So T TFEC is absolutely, it's not that. It will be supported for a long time. Uh, you, can, uh, you can keep using it if you want, but if you really want to move to DevOps, Git really helps. Uh, the, the modern pull requests and, yeah? Can I? Comment this. Um, if, if I can put that in an email, yes, I can. I, I'm not sure if it helps, but um, because people say, we don't want to move to Git. Yeah, that's something that I also hear. I mean, I do a lot of consultancy. Of course, we've got problems with that, but it's mostly we need to educate people. You need to make sure that it's a part of the project, of, of, of the product, so it's supported, it works, it's just standard Git. It's not different from GitHub or GitLabs or Bitbucket or whatever. The protocol beneath is the same. It's supported and it works really well. So, yeah, it's another comment. The question was, do we use the hybrid version where we combine TFEC and Git? Um, yes, because if you look at it, this is one single team project which mixes one TFEC, that's the first one, and a lot of Git repositories. But it's not that you, I mean, you don't mix them in one repository. I don't think that would make sense anyway to do, but we do use them within one team project for different scenarios. Does this answer your question? Okay, perfect. Okay. That was a short introduction to our DevOps home, the way we like to use VSTS, so dashboards, markdown files, Git, Git flow, pull requests, everything. Another part which is really interesting and which I want to share with you is how we build extensions, because that's real tooling and it's probably that's something that you that can use in your own projects, and I hope we can contribute something to the community this way. Has anyone already used a VSTS or TFS extension? Yeah, some? Okay. For builds, yeah. There are also for builds, yeah. There, there are extensions for build tasks, release tasks, or widgets, or other parts of the product. Has anyone already built an extension? We've got one. Cool. Okay. Well, a really short introduction. I mean, this is no extension 101 session, but an extension in VSTS and TFS is actually quite simple. 
It is a manifest file which describes the name of your extension and what it does and where it plugs into the project. It's a couple of markdown and other files that describe your extension on the marketplace so people know what they're getting into. And finally, it's the code. And the code of the extension is just JavaScript. A JavaScript with some CSS, some HTML, and that's your extension. So combining those three gives you an extension. And what I want to do, I want to show you how we do DevOps when it comes to our extensions. And this is the DevOps process as we try to follow it. As we already mentioned, we try to use Lean and Kanban when it comes to our process. We try to make sure that our process is lightweight and that we optimize as much as possible. We use Git. We use Git for all our extensions. And some are on GitHub, some are internal to our own account and will hopefully be open source sometime in the future. But if you want to look at examples, go to GitHub. There are a lot of examples of how we use them. And although the code is in GitHub, we still use our build and release processes within VSTS. Eh? They align together, you can use them together, and it's really easy to do. We try to use to have an automated build and deploy for all of our extensions. And when we started one and a half, two years ago, we're building the first extensions, it was easy. We only had one extension. Uh, and well, we built it, our program manager took the, the file and he deployed it to the, to the marketplace and we were done. We now have more than 20 extensions. So it starts becoming cumbersome to do it by hand and we have started optimizing the process. So Kanban, Git, continuous integration, continuous deployment with everything that VSTS has to offer. So we use uh, build, the, the new build system, the task-based build system. We use release management for the deployments. We use Azure uh, to make sure that we can store our files and stuff like that. Testing, we try to use uh, as much as possible uh, unit tests in our extensions. Uh, we uh, use TypeScript to write the extensions, uh, which is a lot easier than writing plain JavaScript to make sure that we can scale. We also write our unit tests in TypeScript, and uh, we try to make sure that we mock out the dependencies that we have on VSTS, and that we can test them in an automated way. There is still a lot of manual testing. We're, one thing we're not doing yet is uh, automated UI testing, something like Selenium. Uh, that's the next step that we want to take to make sure yeah, the code compiles, unit tests, but it also functions correctly in a browser. User feedback. Well, the marketplace has a direct option to get feedback. Hey, you can uh, post reviews on the marketplace, and we try to respond to them as nicely as possible and work with people when they got a bug or when they got a feature request. What we've also done is we instrument all our extensions. So we use Microsoft Application Insights, a part of Azure, and we've made sure that all our extensions have post custom events to Application Insights and general users data. So we know, for example, how many people use the extension, what bugs they run into. We use application which has smart detection. So maybe someone has used it already, which just says, hey, I see that something is going wrong because it's different than it was before. And normally the load time is one second, and now it suddenly is five seconds. Is that an error? And you should look into it. So sometimes I get an email which says, hey, one of the extensions you work on suddenly has produced a couple of errors. Do you want to look into it? And as I said, we try to use Microsoft Azure as much as possible. I want to show you a demo of how this looks, what it looks like, how we use it from our extension pipeline. This is the marketplace. If you haven't installed the extension yet, please go have a look at the marketplace. It's, Fizzle, it's marketplace at fizzlestudio.com. And as you can see, there are uh, a couple of popular extensions. This one is developed by me as one of the ALM ranges, uh, Microsoft Folder Management, so quite happy with that one. These are developed by Microsoft themselves and are really big extensions to the product. And so definitely check them out. And uh, yeah, well, extensions are, are, are added well, daily. So at least once a week, go to the new extensions, see if something uh, is useful for you, and please try it out. And once you have an extension, for example, this is the countdown widget, which I want to show you how it works. You can install it directly in VSTS, or you can download it and install it in TFS. Right? So it's both on-premises and cloud, no problem. Here you see the markdown information and how you can contribute to it. And here you see the, re the user reviews. Please, if you use one of our extensions, often, or an extension from someone else, if you use an extension, leave a review. Let us know what you think of it. Because as ALM ranges, I mean, we work for the community, so we need to know what the community thinks of us. We need to know uh, what do you like, 
What should we do? What should we add? And once it's a good idea, we'll pitch the idea, create a project, and we'll do it. So uh, that's the way we work. So if you've got feedback, please give it to us. Well, this particular extension, Countdown Widget, as you can see, you already saw it working on the dashboard of the ALM ranges. It can count down to a specific day, or it can count down to the end of the sprint. It's completely open source. This one is on, uh, on GitHub, so you can view the code, you can work with it. Please feel free to uh, branch it, fork it, create a pull request. Uh, we want to work with the community, and whatever you have, please let us know. If you look at the code for this extension, I've got Fizzle Studio 2017, the release candidate here. As I mentioned, this is uh, the, uh, the manifest file, which says, OK, what's the name of my extension? What's the version? Where does it, like, where can you get support? What files does it include? And what contributions does it give? And we try to use, as I already mentioned, we try to use TypeScript. So, this is a part of this is some TypeScript code that kickstarts the extension and helps you starting it. This is our application insights um, link. So here uh, we do stuff like uh, track page views or track custom events. For example, for the countdown widget, we've got events that make sure that we know how many of our extensions of, of, of our installs use the sprint countdown and how many use the regular countdown. Which one is more popular uh, and we also make sure that we track the errors for each other. We know where we need to invest on. And finally, you've got some HTML. So this is the basic HTML that kickstarts the extension. And so all it does is it loads the correct CSS, some SDK scripts, and finally, it starts the extension. So that's a really general introduction to extensions. Now I want to show you how our DevOps pipeline works. First of all, these are all our builds. As you've already seen, we store our code in Git repositories, be it on GitHub or locally in VSTS. And we try to use the continuous integration build for each widget we have or each extension we have. So this is the one for countdown widget, uh, the code I just showed you. As you can see, we try to do things like, um, well, it's mostly JavaScript. And so we use NPM and Grunt to make sure that we have all the packages and that we can compile the extension and that we can uh, package it. This one, replace token, is really simple. It's just a PowerShell script, and it runs, and it makes sure that the application inside instrumentation key, which you can get from the portal, is added to the extension. So we don't try to hard code settings like that. We make sure that we can configure them easily in the build, and it's the same for all extensions, and we can easily update them. White source is also really interesting. White source is a product, um, it's a commercial product, and we're, we're testing its ALM ranges that scans your application for known vulnerabilities. So it will check things like, hey, you are using open source libraries, but they've got security issues, or they've got performance issues, or maybe licensing issues, and it will uh, make sure that you get a detailed report of it. And we try to implement that for all our applications to make sure uh, that we comply with the things Microsoft asks for us and we don't have any security problems. But the question is, does it also do security vulnerabilities? Yes. Question is, um, if you can run it on-prem? I think so. I'm not sure. We, we are using it in VSTS, but I will check it, and we can, you can uh, get in touch with me, and I'll, I'll let you know if you can run it on-prem. Now, finally, uh, we run unit tests. Here is some custom code, which is written in Python, because we're doing JavaScript unit tests, and we need to parse the results, and then make sure that we link them to VSTS. If you're interested in stuff like this, uh, if you want to make sure that you can test your JavaScript or your TypeScript, uh, Please drop us a note. We're always willing to share stuff and make sure that you can use it. Finally, the extension is packaged and it's published. So this is the continuous integration build. It runs for every check-in, be it on GitHub, be it on VSTS, and we try to expand it. One thing I was discussing today with our program manager is we're not doing SonarCube yet. So we're not manage uh, SonarCube is a product that manages technical depth, uh, that measures the quality of your code. That's not something we, we've implemented. We sometimes do it ourselves. Uh, we run linters and other tools, but we haven't made it a part of the pipeline yet. So I hope that's going to be one of our next steps to make sure that we uh, not only create extensions, but we also get a uh, good quality extensions with great code quality. When the build finishes, we go to a release, and here you see all the release definitions we have. Uh, each extension has its own release definition. And for example, for countdown widget, it looks like this. 
They're all pretty similar. What we've done is we've uh, created three environments. We made sure that we have a dev, beta, and a production environment. Dev goes to our sandbox accounts, uh, what I showed in, this, in the slide. Beta goes to the Ranger account, and product production goes to the marketplace. So this is the moment it becomes really public. This is a custom extension, published extension, so it's an extension to help write extensions. And you can find it on the marketplace. We've worked with the Microsoft product group to make sure that uh, we filled all the gaps and it really worked for the scenarios we were trying to do. And you can use it now. You, uh, it's just easy to install and use. And if you look at the properties, uh, it goes to the marketplace, in this case, uh, our own private publisher, and we do things like, hey, what's, what's the name? We add a tag, and we say, okay, we want to have it in this account. But if you look at production, we say it's public, it doesn't have a tag, and we publish on the Microsoft Dev Labs, uh, which is the public account we use on the marketplace. What we've also done is set up security. If you look at the Dev phase, as you can see, it's completely automated. Uh, both the pre-deployment and the post-deployment approval are automated, which means that whenever someone makes a code change and checks in or pushes his changes, uh, there will be a continuous integration build, and once the build finishes, there will always be a deployment to the dev environment, always. So we will, we will, we will always check, is the package valid? Are all the files there? Can we deploy it? Uh, sometimes we will do some manual tests after it on Sandbox 1. Sometimes uh, we'll just leave it at there. And then when you go to the next environment, you will see that someone has to approve it, and we've configured it uh, with this option, anyone uses. So me, our program manager, or Matthias, one of us has to approve it, and then it goes to beta. And maybe you can guess it already. For production, we say, OK, we want to make sure that everyone approves it. So this is not a single user action, uh, but we all get a message that we need to approve a release, and once we've approved it, uh, it goes to the public marketplace. And finally, when it is in production, we start measuring uh, with, with application insights I mentioned already. Uh, we, we start looking, how is our product used? Now, for example, this is the data for the countdown widget. As you can see, this is data for the past 24 hours. Apparently, almost now 40,000 uh, regular countdown widgets were created and 20,000 sprint countdown widgets were created. So we try to monitor this data. We try to see uh, how many uses, how many sessions, popularity. Apparently, the Netherlands is in fourth place. So we are using this widget in the Netherlands. But the United Kingdom and United States are all, also really high. You can see which browsers people mostly use, and uh, you can monitor all kinds of stuff. We've got the same for folder management, which is also an extension I worked on. And then you can see, hey, do people use TFEC repositories? Do they use Git repositories? How many people open the dialog and then just close it? How many people open it and enter a folder name, which is a duplicate? And how many people succeed in creating a new folder? And that helps to attract the users of the extension and make sure that we can optimize for certain scenarios. So that's our DevOps pipeline. Now we try to use Git, Kanban, automatic build, automatic deploy, and finally application insights to monitor everything. And we're still expanding. Uh, White source is the newest addition. SonarCube will maybe be a new addition or other things we can do. Uh, we try to work on it. We also try to publish as much of this as possible. If you want to know more about how this pipeline works, then the MSCN magazine, I hope you all know about the MSCN magazine. It's free. Uh, you can find it online. You can also, if you've got an MSCN subscription, you can take a subscription and they'll send it to you. Um, in the issue of August last year, we wrote a complete article that showed how to do DevOps for extensions. So everything that's discussed here, uh, you can read it for yourself at your own pace if you want. That's what I wanted to show you. If there are questions or other things, well, please let me know. Call to action for you. I hope that you will use our products. Hey, look at the guidance we have, look at the articles we write, look at the tooling, the extensions we create, and if you install something or download something or read our blogs, please let us know what you think of it. Uh, leave a review, albeit a one to five star rating, uh, if you're low on time, please let us know. Also, if you've got problems, let us know. Uh, we are here to fill gaps, we want to help the community, we want to make sure uh, that, that VSTS and TFS can be used as widely as possible, as broadly as possible, and everyone 
and knows how it works. So if there are problems, we really like to hear them. And probably there is, I don't know from which country everyone is, but there are probably ALM ranges in your own country that you can uh, approach. And otherwise, you can always use our Twitter account or uh, make sure that you send us an email or something through our blog. We will always respond. If you want to become an ALM ranger, that's also interesting, there is a nomination process. It comes down to you approach someone who is already an ALM ranger. It helps if you already know each other. You explain what you do, why, why you want to be a ranger, why you're passionate about ALM or DevOps or Agile, what you want to contribute to the community, and your nomination will go to the rangers. A couple of rangers will look at it, and they will do what's mostly called the Google Bing test. Uh, they will drop your name in Google and Bing, and they will just see what shows up. And if they see, ah, oh, he's got an active blog, or he speaks at uh, user events, or he tries to share his knowledge on Twitter, or uh, whatever, I mean, even if it's small, uh, that really helps in getting your nomination accepted. So if someone's interested, well, you can always approach me or uh, go to our Twitter or blog account. You can find our Twitter account at um, ALM Ranges. Uh, we're always open for Q&A. Uh, 24 hours a day now. I mean, there are a lot of ranges, so you, you will probably find someone who can help you with living near you or uh, who speaks your language. So that was the session. If you want to contact me, you can always find me at Twitter, email, or my own blog. And I hope you've learned something from the, AM, from the ALM ranges and that you can use it in your own projects. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. And um, we obviously we try to keep it up to date every every release within within a month. But if we wanted to go to the online version, how would we? What would be a good strategy for keeping the deployment part internal? So would you just do the builds in cloud, store them in the version control, and then use the deployment to pull them in? How does it integrate with on-prem release? The question is. Um, we're now using TFS on-premises. We need to update every time. Every three months, there's a new update, and it costs a lot of time. What if you move to the cloud? Can we still deploy to on-premises? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, the deployment model, I mean, we are doing it in Azure because for us, it's really easy. But it also supports on-premises deployments. So you can even run your builds on-premises. And you can even make sure that you store your source code maybe so somewhere else. It's all up to you. But yes, that's, that's definitely possible. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time.